Kentucky Appeal. Every week, Kentucky Appeal brings you features on hunting and fishing across the state. What a nice fish. It's an opportunity to hopefully get that bird in play. Hey, we got another one over here. There he is. Ooh, a nice one, too. Boy, he's healthy. What do we got? <laughs> that was awesome. He got the first help. Barely made it out of the field. Got one big small mouth. Very nice. Double point. They're in there. There they go. Look at that joker. Woo. <laughs> That's a good one there. Look at that. Whoa, this is a good one. That's better than good, Chad. Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles, and tonight you have tuned in for our annual spring turkey question and answer show. Joining me as usual, I have a panel of guests to answer all of your questions. You can submit those questions using our social media platforms, or you can actually text your question in. First up, I have a face you've seen quite a bit before, Zach Danks. Zach, you're the turkey program coordinator, and you've been doing that now for quite a few years, haven't you? Yeah, eighth year. Eighth year, so he can talk about some of the trends we've had, also, what we're looking forward to this year as far as our turkey population. Yep. Next up, I have Jacob Stewart. And Jacob, you are a private lands biologist. I know you uh, official title is private lands biologist or private lands program coordinator. So if a person out there that has a piece of property that wants to attract more wildlife, and tonight we're going to mainly talk about turkeys, yeah. you can help us out with that, can't you? Yeah, Chad, we have a program. We have biologists out across the state uh, set up to help you reach your management goals. This ain't our management goals, it's your management goals, whether that be turkey, deer, uh, butterflies, birds, whatever you're looking for, we are there to help you uh, along your way. All right, fantastic. I know a lot of people wanna know, how can I attract more turkeys to my property? So tonight's the night you get the answer for yeah. that. And then join us on the end, we have Travis uh, Abrams. Travis, you're a conservation officer out of the third district. Yes, sir. Glad to have you here. Hey, thanks for having me. Happy to be third here. Third district's a great area to hunt turkeys. There's a lot of areas in the third district that uh, that get a lot of turkey pressure. There's also some uh, WMAs within the third district that are pretty popular for turkey hunting. So yes, sir. Yeah. Very glad to have you. All right, um, this year, let's, let's first start off with our season dates because really that's the most important. So this year, um, our youth turkey season starts on April the 6th and 7th. That's the youth weekend. Tra tell, me, uh, tell me there, Travis, to qualify to hunt the youth season, what do you have to do to qualify to hunt the youth season? Well, you have to be under the age of 15 years old. 12 to 15 is a youth. You'd be required to have a youth hunting license as well as a youth turkey permit. Anyone under the age of 12 is licensed and permit exempt. Okay. Now you still have to tell check those birds regardless. Yes, sir. You still have to tell check the birds same, same exact way. Um, hunter ed is required for those that meet the requirements. Okay. Yep. So uh, hopefully you've got your hunter ed certification taken care of. If not, you know you can go on there and do that online, uh, with the exception of the range portion. Do we still have the option now, if, you, if you've if you never used a one-year exemption, do you have a one-year exemption available for people who have not taken the Yes, sir. Yep. It's still around. You, you got it for a year. After that year, though, you, you'd have to go get one. Okay. Yep. All right. And then the, uh, the regular turkey season this year, the general turkey season, this year opens up on April the 13th. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about April 13th and how you personally picked that date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not, not me personally. And, in any given year, it varies because the the youth season is the first full weekend in April. So this year, you didn't get a Saturday and Sunday until the 6th and the 7th. Okay. Last year, it was the 1st and 2nd. Yeah. The general season is the Saturday closest to the 15th, which this year happens to be the 13th. So, so it ranges from April 12th to April 18th. So when the date shifts, it's based on the calendar, Saturday close to April 15th. So this year we kind of mo we moved our seasons closer together because they're literally the back-to-back -back weekends. Mm -hmm. Our general season came early, a little bit earlier, and our youth season went a little later. So uh, mm -hmm. that is a hundred percent set by the calendar, and it's been that way for how many years now? Um, I think since two thousand six. Okay, uh, was the last change we made to dates. So a lot of times we hear people say, man, I wish the season was earlier, or, or sometimes traditional bow hunters want more foliage out, they want it to be later. The simple fact is, the, the dates are set by reg and regulation, and they are based on the calendar, how the calendar falls. That's right, yep. It, 
and for a period of years in the early 2000s, sometimes we'd open on a Wednesday or a Monday. Sometimes we'd April, April 15th exactly, so it would vary the day of the week that it opened. But people yeah. like the weekend opener. Uh, we've got a 23-day season, four weekends, so it's a lot of opportunity for folks. Yeah, and you said a 23-day season, so we, we're going to be going from April the 13th all the way out till May 5th. Mm -hmm. So um, that uh, it's a good amount of time. <laughs> to get out regardless of your work schedule or your kids' activities. It's a good amount of time to get out and pursue turkey hunting this year. It is. All right, we have been getting questions. Uh, we, we did a little thing online where we were offering hats to the first three questions that we asked. I have three questions here that have been picked. So if you are one of the first three questions we, we asked today, you will be receiving one of these Kentucky Field camouflaged hats. So first up, let's see, we have Gregory Guk Eisen, and uh, his question is, what is the overall condition of the turkey population here in Kentucky? Pretty broad question, but it's a question that everyone wants to know the answer to. It is, yep. Yeah, new hunters, veteran hunters, everybody wants to know what turkey numbers are like. Overall, you know, simplest answer I can give is that we have a healthy population in this state. Um, we People come from many states to hunt turkeys here, and uh, you know, we've got lots of opportunity. Uh, a lot of public land to pursue birds. Uh, private lands uh, is the majority of our state, but numbers are down somewhat from what they were maybe 10, 12 years ago when we kind of hit a high in our population. But populations come down some, but it's still very strong. Uh, other states have seen population declines a little more severe than we have. We're very stable, generally speaking. Uh, we do fluctuate some. Mm -hmm but still a very good chance, very good flock in our state, and um, we, we need people to be good conservationists. We need our conservation officers and everybody pulling in the same direction, but all things equal, we've got a good, good flock. A lot of times when people ask about what the turkey populations are, they're obviously concerned about the overall number of birds, but when you're a hunter, you really want to know about two-year-old male birds, right? Yeah. Two-year and older male birds. Right. Mm -hmm. What's that population looking like? It's it's pretty good. So uh, last year, 2023, we was our second highest harvest ever, and that was directly a product of the really good hatch we had in 2021, okay. because birds that survived, uh, poults that survived 2021, a lot of them were males, grew up to be two-year-olds last year, and we had a had a great season. Uh, the hatch was hasn't been quite as good the last two springs, but it's been good, stable and there's a lot of jakes out there right now okay. so first time hunter kids um, i mean anybody if you want to take a jake but there's a lot of jakes so uh, it's two-year-old bird numbers are still good but we've got uh, next year is probably even brighter i would expect but okay still good this year though all right next question is from jameson netherly he <laughs> wants to know what is the best way to increase turkey habitat and population on private lands. He wants to know a little bit about trapping and wants to know uh, if there's any ways to help keep and maintain a healthy flock of birds. So what, what would you say if you're gonna say two things that you need to do on a 100 acre track of property, what were the two things you'd recommend right off the bat? So right off the bat, uh, if you noticed what Zach said, the importance of the hatch, uh, leading to the number of birds two years later that we're able to harvest. Yeah. Uh, so the most important thing we can do for turkey populations in the state is to provide the habitat for nesting and brooding and getting those broods up to be the age that we can harvest them. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 to 70 percent in some studies of a poults are die. So at the end of the day it is really important to increase the number of uh, poults that make it to your jakes and then your two-year-old birds later you can harvest. So the way you do that is you provide nesting cover, so some thick type shrubby cover with uh, some, some uh, native grasses, that kind of stuff, in close proximity to what we call brooding cover. So really thin type grasses, uh, or, or sorry, uh, grasses and forbs or wildflower mix that uh, produce uh, insects because those first uh, two to four weeks, uh, our first week to four weeks, those uh, insects are very important for the poults. And then really survival of a poult after four weeks 
it's pretty well exponential on going up on survival. So that first four weeks is, you know, crucial. So providing some nesting cover and brooding cover are the two main things that I would say, if you're gonna do two things to help your turkey population, that's the key to it right there. Okay. And then they wanna know a little bit about, uh, about uh, predators. Um, tell me some of the big predators for turkey nest, and then if you uh, if you would put a plan together to address that, or if there's good habitat, they got a way to hide, so that's going to help a lot. But uh, as far as nest raiders, what what do you what predators are the worst for turkeys? So Zach, jump in here if I'm uh, if I miss any, but your your raccoons, uh, your skunks, your possums, uh, snakes, uh, as far as your nest predators go, uh, is is a big thing. And you know the whole idea behind trapping. Trapping is is a is just another management tool uh, to help you get down the road. Uh, habitat and trapping are two things that you need to have together to really be successful. Uh, really, just doing one or the other is not the end uh, end game. There's no magic uh, bullet to that. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, uh, it's a whole lot easier not to mow than to put all the effort into trapping. And now not mowing will equal better habitat and protection from those predators. It's amazing. It doesn't matter what uh, what species we're talking about. It could be in the fall. We're talking about deer. It could be small game habitat. It really always comes down to if you have the piece of property, sometimes it's less work, less mowing, less spraying, allowing certain areas to get, get thick to raise young always tends to be a good way to go and certain times of year mowing can be extremely detrimental because the young is, are there and it can be really 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 bad so well, yeah. I think that's the key you know what Jake was saying no, don't mow he's talking about during the nesting season mm -hmm. yes. which here is April you know it's yeah. when our first nest happened um, all through May and then of course you got uh, hatching so we'll have poults on the ground in May June especially mm -hmm. even into July for re -nest. Uh, so really, if you could stay off the bush hog between April and August, it would be, you're up in your odds. And then you can do mowing for maintenance or management, yeah. you know, along with other better practices that, that we biologists would like to see, like uh, prescribed fire or strip disking or real targeted specific herbicide applications. But avoiding that nesting season is really your best bet. But keeping things moving, you want a diversity of cover types managed different ways on, on any property to maximize use by turkey. You could have zero predators and you run over two or three turkey nests with a tractor, uh, oh, it yeah. doesn't matter. You've not increased, you can eliminate the landscape of predators if you mow over the eggs, it, you're going to have zero poults. <laughs> yeah, some recent yeah. research in Tennessee showed a good proportion of their nest loss was from mowing. So if you did implement a trapping program on your place, which is great, do it. But if you could expect to influence the number of predators or, or increase turkey productivity 10%, that would be phenomenal. Like you don't even see that in research where they do real intensive predator management. But just for mowing alone, they mowed up like, I forget, 13 or 12, 13% of the nest just in mowing. Yeah. So that alone, if we could do that across the state, do a better job at staying off it, you know, we're not, you know, Unfortunately, prime haymaking time in this state is right during nesting season. Mm -hmm. If you're trying to make a living growing hay, that's one thing. But if there's fields you don't have to, to mow or, or mow early, then that's a good way to up your population. Just stay off the bush hogs. So if you're trying to trap and you're market. creating shooting lanes and you're mowing shooting lanes Do to shoot the coyotes, then you, you're, you, your net, net loss is bad. I mean, even if you yeah. kill some coyotes, you're probably net net. If you've mowed strips and you probably are net down just because you may have destroyed a couple turkey nests. And yeah. That can be a huge, uh, a huge loss. Yeah. Next question uh, is from Don Ellis. What are the guidelines for turkey hunting on WMAs and where are these posted for everyday viewing? So what are the rules and regulations as it pertains to turkey hunting on WMAs? And uh, do we have quota hunts for turkey hunting, turkey on w, WMAs, or are they pretty much all open to normal statewide regs? It depends on the WMA. Um, a lot of them have their own regulations that a hunter would have to follow. Um, like I said, it varies. So you can find that information on our website under the public lands, public hunting tab. Uh, search whichever particular WMA you're interested in hunting at, 
and it can give you all the regs that you need to find out before you get out there and get after it. I would say that to be successful turkey hunting, man, you want to do some scouting on a WMA. I would think that that would, uh, would definitely help your chances to get out there and do some scouting. And scouting, a lot of times, people think scouting means you need to go through, you need to find all the food sources. Turkeys can move in pretty good ways, can't they? Mm -hmm. what, the best way to scout is probably with your ears, isn't it? Yeah. You know, when he gets out to that week or two before the season, uh, look at those fields and scan from long distance. You don't have to walk through and look under every tree to do scouting, do you? No. 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 Are you, have you guys started doing any scouting yet for your for your uh, youth tur turkey hunts? I know both of you guys have kids that may be participating in the youth hunt this yeah. year. Mm -hmm. You guys done started any scouting or still early? I have. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Still, still, uh, it's not early. Just haven't had the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and then sometimes it's just exciting to show up and hear what you hear. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> we made the comment. Uh, look at the rules and regulations by checking out the guides this year different than in past years our turkey hunting guides are actually not printed on paper uh, as what we're seeing is everyone's going to one of these um, and it's much easier to access an entire turkey guide so the best way to do it this year is to actually go online and there's a qr code and we'll show you this qr code here in a second you can actually go on and hit that hit that qr code and get the turkey guide on there and search through it probably the best and easiest way so if you're waiting for that turkey guide to hit your local retail store it's already available it's just available online so make sure you go on there click on it and, and read your rules and regulations and make sure that nothing has changed in the area that you're hunting and uh, refresh yourself on all of our rules and regulations as it pertains to turkey hunting so uh, always grab a guide I always throw it in my truck or in my boat and I've noticed that I've always go to my phone to get my answer because it's just, <laughs> yep. it seems like yeah. it's easier. Yeah. And now with the, on the fishing side, you got the boat fishing uh, app. That seems to have all the information you need too. So mm -hmm. um, if you, uh, if that's something that uh, you'd like to have a printed copy, you can always go online and print it off of there as well. But I'll tell you, if you get used to using your phone, it's pretty handy. So next question we have from Colby. Mm -hmm. What are your top tips for public land turkey hunting? We talked a little bit about it. What, what tips would you give a person that's uh, going to public land hunt this year? Start online with our interactive map, uh, our website. Go to where to hunt, and you'll find a map of the state. You can zoom in. Um, you'll see the boundaries. Spend some time looking on there. At least one of our WMAs has additional maps of, on where habitat practices are. Mm -hmm. uh, there's maybe others. And then you know you got your favorite app, Onyx or whatever program you use, uh, but but be sure and look at our website because it's going to have up-to-date boundaries on it. Because sometimes we acquire new properties, and just want to make sure you've got your maps laid out right. Uh, I think our younger generation of hunters are pretty savvy with using technology, but anybody can get online and and uh, can, and scroll around and look for ridges, look for saddles if you're in the mountains, look for you know where fields and woods meet, you know, think about entry points and ex exit points that you could use, but that everybody else might use and mm -hmm. places you might want to avoid. Tell me, um, are you going to be hunting public or private land hunting this year or a little bit of both? Both, I hope. Both? Okay. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jacob? I do both. Uh, okay. Predominantly, actually, I enjoy hunting the public land. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a runner and gunner, uh, which means I like to mess up my own turkey hunt most <laughs> of the time. Uh, so uh, so the, uh, the idea of public land hunting, uh, you know, I've had a lot of good, uh, before I took this job, I ran a management area, uh, which gave me the opportunity to get out early and hunt. And I've had a lot of really good hunts. People think you need to go early. Uh, later in the season, when all them hens get on the nest, uh, I've heard a whole lot of goblin and had some really good hunts late. Uh, and the WMAs really decreased the number of the pressure of people coming uh, out later in the uh, later in the season. So yeah. don't think it's a, it's a loss uh, if you don't get out there the first two weeks. Okay, uh, for sure. Officer Abrams, are you going to hunt this year? Oh, yeah, yeah, you bet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> what are you going to hunt? Are you going to hunt public or private lands? I hunt wherever I can. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I got I got a private land spot. Okay, I like to go to. Yes, sir. Tell me, tell me how you would approach, or maybe it's no change. If you the, think about the, the public land you plan on hunting this year and the private land you're, you're going to hunt, do you alter how you hunt for public versus private land any at all? Um, think about this year. Do you, do, you, do you approach that a little different, be it 
the use of decoys, be it how much you move, um, where you set up. Do you take a different approach if it's public versus private lands? Probably some, yeah. Because I, I think I do is a little bit as well. Less decoys, yeah. less calling. Um, I'll go later in the year on public. Yeah. Because uh, we've had luck together doing that. Yeah. Um, and this year I'm looking forward to hunting eastern Kentucky. Hunting, okay. Hunting the mountains, which I've really done very little of. So it'll be different there just because my private land is, is not there. So be just by virtue of different geography, but yeah. It, it's bigger properties than the private lands I hunt, so I can uh, run and gun more if need to. Mm -hmm. So it'd be a little different for me. What about you? Do you think you take a different approach, uh, um, public land versus private land? Yeah, I think uh, you know your your private land. You know, most people probably have an average between 50 and 100 acres, uh, and it can get pretty frustrating hearing that bird gobbling on the other side of the fence, uh, <laughs> and and, and uh, you know wishing it was here, which. On your public land, you have a little more of the ability to work multiple birds. You know, take your time spending in the woods, just trying to trying to find them. Uh, you know, and the thing, I think the the key to all turkey hunting is the idea of knowing your landscape that you're hunting, to so know how that bird may or may not react, where they may be gobbling. Uh, I've had a lot of times on private land, you'll sit there and hunt, and there'll be a bird gobbling and strutting. Uh, and then there's a woven wire fence that they will not come through no matter how hard you call or what you do. Uh, it just deters them. So knowing yeah. that kind of stuff really helps you, uh, you know, pick where you're going to sit up and how you hunt. Yeah, that, uh, that's a good point. If there's a barrier there, I mean, and even things that we not even, won't even think of as barriers, turkeys are finicky, aren't they? There's yeah. certain things that will hold a bird up. And you're like, what in the world? That bird once mm -hmm. come here, it's gobbling like crazy. How come I can't get this bird to finish? It could be the silliest thing. Like I say, it could be so, uh, a fence that you didn't even know was there. You can't yeah. see it until you walk down there and you're like, huh, Yeah. I was trying to call this bird through here and it just won't make it. I've even seen them hold it up on creeks and just strut back and forth and you're like, you could fly. You yeah. can come right across there if you want, you know? It's just a jump for a bird and two wing flaps, yeah. but for whatever reason, they just, they, they're, they're finicky like that. Yeah. Uh, next uh, question is from Cruz. Want to know if you can purchase additional turkey tags? No, not, uh, I guess, uh, youth. If you don't have the youth sportsman and you just have the youth turkey permit, then you could purchase a second one. It's my understanding to get your second bird. Correct, yeah, bird for, bird. for the youth. Okay. But uh, everybody else, you just have, the only option would be to get a bonus bird on one of the, the federal properties, Fort Knox, Fort Campbell. Um, or one of the options we have for a commissioner's tax. Yeah. Otherwise, your your statewide license covers the two tags that you get. Okay. And uh, we always get this question. Uh, we we do allow two birds uh, in Kentucky. But they have to be taken on different days. They can't be taken at the same time because we get that question a lot. How come other states, I guess, do allow <laughs> multiple birds to be taken in one day, mm -hmm. but uh, not here in Kentucky? It has to be two separate days, right? Yep. There's a, there's a number of states that allow you to take both, but most states are one per day. Yeah. It's just a way to spread the pressure out. Yeah. yeah. Um, the next question, can you hunt with a bow or crossbow instead of a firearm? Tell me about, uh, and, how, and how often, first off, what's your answer? Can you? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's totally legal to use a, a bow or a crossbow. Um, either bow or crossbow, there's no minimum draw weight. You got to be careful with the uh, your broadhead, though. It can't be a barbed broadhead, and it has to be no greater than seven-eighths of an inch. Okay. So um, tell me a little bit about, uh, and you said no greater or no less than seven-eighths of an inch on the, no. on the broadhead. No less. No less. Yeah, I think Todd, you said no time. greater. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. That. Yep. No, yeah. It has to be. It has to be at least seven eighths of an inch. Yes, right. sir. Yes. yes. Okay. Gotcha. Um, how many people do you see out using uh, using a? There's there's not many. Yeah. Not many people using a string. Um, it's tough. So you know, whenever I see it, I kind of tip my hat to it. Yeah. But for most parts, people using shotguns. Yeah. And I was, but I will tell you, um, we have some people here in the department. I know that pretty much predominantly. Hunt. We have a wildlife biologist at Lacefield, and he likes to hunt late in the year, and he does it for the cover. He wants everything to be bloomed out so that he has more camo. He yeah. turkey hunts with uh, with a self bow that he that he makes every year, doesn't he? He does, yeah. And I know that he does take birds from time to time, so that uh, it's pretty impressive. It can yes. happen, can it? Right. And I'll tell you what, the use of a blind would be, you know, if you're going to bow hunt them, being able to have a bird close enough to draw back on, and that's a lot of movement. 
with the bow and arrow to come to full draw, having a blind would be helpful, I would say. But yep. you you can get out there and you can you can take them with uh, without that you know, drawing a bow and shooting them. But uh, I tell you what, you better put your time in. <laughs> um, next question: We're getting uh, questions about turkey banding. Turkey banding. We actually did a show. We went out with you guys, and I think mm. we were in Woodford County, if I ain't mistaken. Yep. And um, turkey banding involves turkey baiting. Yep. And I've learned really fast why baiting turkeys is illegal. Because, man, when you get the birds to start coming, you get them all, don't you? You get a lot, yeah. You <laughs> and can. We uh, went out there and set up a trap and, uh, and, and uh, put some bait out. And it took a few hours, but when they came in, we mm -hmm. were able to uh, take quite a few turkeys and put bands on them and release them back out. Tell me a little bit about banding and what's going on in the world of banding turkeys and what we're yeah. learning. Yeah, so the banding project is, is designed to help us understand harvest pressure on our population. So we do this with all kinds of wildlife. Um, turkeys are difficult because they're, they're hard to, hard to get uh, that many birds hitting a spot consistently, have them there the day that you're out there and, and catch them. I mean, there's a lot of effort that goes into it. So that show right there, you know, we were just there one day, but Joe Lacefield and some helpers, landowners had been baiting the site for a while, you know, because sometimes it takes birds a while to find it. But uh, yeah, by putting bands on, on those male birds, when they're then subject to harvest, we can look at the percentage of them that get harvested, and that, that helps us estimate what the, uh, what the harvest pressure is like in the greater population, because we're doing this research all across the state. And uh, that's really, in my mind, it's been the first step in research to help us understand, well, are our regulations where they need to be? Mm -hmm. let's, do some, let's do some research and find out. And, you know, because there's a lot of factors that influence turkey populations, but the, the one thing we as a department can control are regulations. And in order to understand that, let's go take some measurements. In this case, the measurements are the bands and the number of them that get harvested. What, uh, what type of uh, uh, percentage of hunters that take a banded bird do, you, do we think reach back out to us? And are there any incentives for them to do that? Yeah, yeah. Um, so everybody that reports to us gets a certificate telling them information about where their bird was banded and how much it weighed. Kind of a nice keepsake you can put on your wall if you'd like to. Uh, there are a percentage of them that are, that are reward bands as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so far uh, we think that our estimates of harvest rates or recovery rates on those bands are about 20 to 30 uh, percent. The research is still ongoing, so we won't know for another couple of years. Uh, this this year, that's pretty much just wrapped. We've just wrapped up our turkey trapping, our third season. Next year, we'll, our fourth season will be the, the final year of the project, and we'll put all that data together. Our research partners at Tennessee Tech University mm -hmm. will will crunch the numbers for us and do some fancy statistical modeling and help us to understand uh, where we are. And the state of Tennessee is doing the same thing. So. Uh, yeah, once that's completed, then we'll have a better sense of, of where things are, actual some hard and fast numbers to go with, you know, the, the other data sources like our telecheck information and our brood surveys and reports from officers and biologists in the field. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question is coming from Ethan Blair. Um, with the national decrease in turkey population, where does Kentucky stand in that? And first off, is there a national or is it regional? What is going on with the, the national turkey population right now? And then break it down kind of close to us here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's pretty much consensus that per turkey populations across the eastern U.S. Are, have come down some from highs seen five to 15 years ago, depending on where you are exactly. Mm -hmm. The southeast seems to have the, the most severe declines. The Midwest has, has seen some decline in several states. Northeast is not not declining to the same degree. Uh, we have have seen some some numbers in some of the mid-Atlantic states, but uh, by and large they're, you know, concerned hunters all over the country. The sky is not falling totally. Um, turkey populations are dynamic, just like all wildlife populations are. 
but a lot of Kentucky hunters and hunters from other states are saying, you know, I'm just not seeing the birds that I saw 15, 20 years ago. What's going on? There's got to be something going on. Well, there's multiple things going on. And so, so there's no silver bullet fix, but, you know, we build more and more houses every day. We simplify our landscape. And there are a lot of predators on the landscape, but part of that's because we don't trap and we make landscapes really simple and make it pretty easy for those predators to thrive. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes we concentrate animals around the feeders that we put out. That probably has implications for the predator populations and how abundant they are, as well as affecting turkey movements. And so there's a, there's a lot of things that that go on, that are going on with turkey populations, and nobody's really got it figured out. Uh, but, you know, we talked about habitat earlier, and biologists like to talk about that, but keep in mind that we're talking about a specific deficit in, on the landscape for a real important life stage of the turkey, and that's that nesting and broodering time period. So if we're mowing up nests before they have a chance, then we're forcing that hen to re-nest, which she can do, but, you know, that's just, rolling the dice, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I do think habitat across our state and other states is part of it. And it just feeds right into the high predator populations. So there's a lot of, lot of issues. Weather really impacts the hatch. Mm -hmm. At least we think that from uh, past decades. And that's highly variable. So when we get lots and lots of rain in April and May, that, that can be really detrimental to to nesting hens and, and then, of course, little little poles that can't thermoregulate. Mm -hmm. Lots of factors. So uh, we, we're seeing this national decline, but uh, from what I'm gathering, it's not like you biologists that are out surveying the landscape. You're not finding dead or deceased mature birds. The not, decline is happening at a nest or poult stage. Yeah, we're not and, making new turkeys like we should be. Gotcha. Yeah, there, there's a host of diseases, and I haven't mentioned that, but yeah that can affect turkeys and, and we have research partners and several states looking into that as well. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say this, any hunter that sees a sick or diseased turkey, please call us. Yeah. Um, especially ones that have wart-like growths on their head and that look really abnormal. Those are ones we really need to try to, mm -hmm. to, try to sample and test. So, Well, all turkey heads look like they have wart, wart growths on it, but this <laughs> right. is a little different what this you're talking different. about. Yes, yeah. Th these are obviously not not normal turkeys. Yeah, uh, they're they're not common, thankfully. But but if you encounter one, we would like we to want to know about it. it. Yeah. yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. um, so next question is from Kylie Johnson. What is a turkey's favorite food? I'm guessing it's the easiest snack right in front of them. But what did, what is a turkey's? If you were going to, to say, if you were going to do a sample and take uh, stomach contents from a turkey, what are you most likely to see the most of? Yeah, it really depends on the season and what we're talking about. You know, this time of year, there's going to be a lot of green in their in their belly. Grasshoppers potentially. Uh, anytime they can get fruits, I can tell you that our trapping this year has been made more difficult because of the good mast crop we have. Mast meaning acorns. Yeah. Uh, we had a good acorn crop last fall, and the birds, when acorns are available, that's where they what they prefer to eat. So they've been in the woods and not coming to our bait piles, which are usually corn or sunflowers, mm -hmm. haven't been coming as, as regularly because they've got this natural food source that they really like. Beech nuts, they love as well. But, you know, other foods they're gonna they're gonna take advantage of. Certainly clovers and blackberries and hackberries they'll eat. I mean just they eat tons and tons of different things. But you know, by and large it's it's either your mast or greens or insects. So you kind of start things. talking about mast uh, acorns, for example, it's really hard to go out and increase your habitat for that because you're talking 20, 30 years down the road, yeah. right? For a tree, uh, for to plant an oak tree and go, right. well, I've got my turkey pot, <laughs> my turkey yeah. uh, habitat's out and ready to go. It doesn't happen like that. But as far as what you can plant, mm -hmm. Jacob, if you were going to say plant one crop and I know you don't want to do that you want to diverse but what do you think it's it's it's, it's what uh, plant do you say this has to be in there for turkeys that it's like because this will be the one that will help the most what do you think that'd be I mean uh, that's uh, 
that's a broad question because it's all kind of seasonality. I mean, I think I think you go with the idea of native aspects, so some something kind of native. And I think I'll go back to the as far as the most important aspect again is is your brooding time. So those insects and those uh, those flowers that you know those those things we call weeds. Uh, anybody here ever uh, pulled what we call stick tights off of them? Yeah, uh, Desmodium is what they are. Is you know the scientific name a little triangles you know those are little peas they love them uh ragweed uh all that kind of stuff is, is the natural type of stuff that you can uh, you know man manage by not uh uh disturbing it uh mm -hmm. letting it you know just putting on some kind of rotation and you know uh nurturing that the native stuff that's there instead of trying to force uh, a crop in that we, it's too dry or uh, it's too wet, you know, trying to stay, trying that. So some kind of uh, natural food source is what you manage for is be the best. You just gave me the best sell story ever to increase our turkey population was that they eat stick tight. So no, yeah. bring back that we eat more yeah. turkeys. Yeah. Because I'll tell you what, yeah. if you've spent much time in the woods, you've been covered yeah. in stick tights. So, I may have to stop picking those off my yeah, clothes. Yeah. Maybe you just pick them as I walk and drop <laughs> maybe a little, 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 little trail. And, and you mentioned that you can't uh, and this is a this is a dynamic of managing your place. We're we're sitting here talking about open field stuff, but you can manage your woods to produce more oak acorns, or to make sure that your woods becomes the next oak forest. Like you might have a, a young forest that is kind of you have the you know your maples and oak fighting. You can go in there and help the oak win. Uh, so yeah, you may not be able to plant oak right now, but. Proper forest management leads you closer to that. Okay. So thinking about forest management uh, is a pretty important aspect to this, as well as your open field management. Mm -hmm. So they spend every yeah. night up in a tree, don't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, it's an important part. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Next question. Uh, <laughs> this is a this is a great question. Why does turkey taste so good? And what they want to know what some of our favorite ways uh, to cook wild turkey. What's your favorite way to have wild turkey? Fried, man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, Kentucky. It's just what I like. It's, it's hard to beat, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I can't. Yeah, Kentucky, Kentucky kernel flour and uh, rolled up and fried. Yeah. yeah. I'm right there with you. Yeah. 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 I will tell you what, have you, any of you guys ever tried, uh, I hate to be advertising for a company out there, but have you ever tried Chick fil A sauce on, a, on turkey tenders? <laughs> <laughs> well, it can't sure, be that good. bad, that's for sure. It'll yeah. ruin you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just telling you. Fry some turkey tender strips and uh, put a little Chick-fil-A sauce yeah. on that. I'm like, wow. This is, uh, I gave them to my kids. I think they thought they'd been to get, getting something from a fast food restaurant. Yeah. They were really tasty. So um, I, I've tried it a bunch of different ways, but it always team, tend to go back to the, uh, the, fried, the fried strips of turkey. T tends yeah. to be my favorite way to have Pretty it. Pretty simple and in a hurry usually. So yeah, I yeah. just go with what I know and it's easy. Next question is from John Bagley. How old does a youth have to be to need a youth license? We talked about this a little earlier, but refresh us on this. How old does a, when do, when do you need to buy a license for a youth? Once a youth turns 12 years old. Okay. And until he's 15 years old. So once he or once they hit 16, they're no longer considered a youth for licensing. So 12 to 15, anything before that, they're exempt. So uh, and if you're if you buy a license, if you buy a youth license and then turn 16, how does that work? So it's good for the whole license year. Okay. Yep. So if you can buy a youth license during the time you can purchase a license, mm -hmm. that's the license you're hunting on the entire year, right? Yes, sir. Yep. So uh, an individual that uh, is. 10 years old doesn't need a license but that uh, doesn't need a license for uh, or a turkey permit they're still good for two birds throughout that season correct yes sir mm -hmm. and then once you acquire a license there is a youth license out there that's one bird right correct so if they just bought let's just say hypothetically they had a youth hunting license and a youth turkey permit that youth turkey permit is only going to cover you for one turkey either the spring or the fall. I know we're talking about spring, so we'll keep on that. Yeah. If, let's just say they shot a turkey and they wanted to go kill another one, um, they could buy another youth permit, turkey permit, and go get after it. Yeah. So if you got three different ways there for youth. Either you don't need a license or you're under 16 and you can have a youth permit or you can have a youth sportsman's youth license sportsman. right so you got three different ways that you can kind of get this done so uh depends on what works best for you if you know if you're going to do deer hunting and you're going to do all the rest then you might as well better go ahead and get the youth sportsman right now the youth sportsman does have two turkey permits on it yeah okay so, 
So there you go. Next question. Can I shoot a turkey from inside their house? What are the rules and regulations on shooting a turkey? Uh, what is the rules and regulations from on, inside their house? From inside their house. As long as it's in season and they're doing it safely. Yeah. Um, and they have proper li- Well, if it's inside their house, they're probably a landowner, so they probably don't, they're probably exempt from <laughs> licensing. Yeah. So that's a, that's yeah. a good question. But now, what about shooting turkeys from a vehicle or a boat? Can't do it from either one, especially a boat. Now, if you're disabled, there's exceptions for you, but it would have to be a stationary vehicle. Mm-hmm. Um, but boat, either way, no. Yeah, yeah. I know a lot of people go out to some of these WMAs that have, uh, you know, they have water on there. And, and it is a really, really good way to locate birds. Absolutely. But you need to get out of that boat and pursue that bird. You can't try to call the bird down and take it from the boat in the water. Right? That's correct. Yeah. I'll tell you what, I've, I've, been, I've been out there fishing and hearing birds, and uh, you do that a couple times. It's the favorite time of year to be on the front of a bass boat. It's also the best time of year and during turkey season to pursue a bird. You find some of these WMAs, you can do both. Now, that, now you've got something. You can fish up until you hear a bird decked out in full camo, put the rod and reel down, beach the boat, pick the shotgun up, chase a bird, come back and go fishing until you hear another one. It, uh, I tell you what, that's a lot of fun. Can't picture a better day than that. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, it's no. a that's a good day. That is a good day. Uh, next question is from Tim Fan, and he wants to know: Can a youth take their hunter safety course as young as nine years old? What's the what what is too young to take your hunter safety? So they need course? to be at least nine years old. That's okay. what we ask. Um, so yeah, if he's nine or or she, then absolutely. Well, the main thing is you got to be able to read, right? And you got to right. be able to read. Uh, the... Got to be able to read. Got to be able to be able to understand it. Um, yeah. You know, because it is important, and the youth. These youths, they got to know that. It's an important thing that we're teaching. Um, and of course, there's a range day involved yeah. with it, too. So, yeah. you know, it gets younger and nine years old. It's a little bit, a little bit tough for them. Yeah. 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 Next question is from Paul Richardson. He wants to know if there's any penalty for killing a bearded hen turkey. Nope. Bearded hen turkeys happen, and, and uh, they're not super common. But, you know, we, we, I've seen bearded hens. I'm sure you've all seen bearded hens. The way the rules and regs are written is that a bearded bird right Correct. it doesn't say I, male either, or female either a male bird or bearded bird yeah. so you can just like it sounds i mean you, you get these hens that have beards and if you come across it and you want to take it you're totally fine to do it just make sure you go about tail checking it the same way yeah okay yeah and you could kill a male technically that did not have a beard it would be extremely rare for that to happen in nature but yeah you know uh, but if you take a, if you take a male bird that has no beard for whatever reason. You better be sure it's a male. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's what I would want to do. Yeah. You want to uh, be sure. I mean, there's ways to tell. These guys tell yeah. you better than I could, but you know, right. especially during the breeding season, the red, white, and blue heads, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, well, you, you want to make sure it's a male. Right, yeah. Yeah. much yeah. more black. Their breast feather, tips of their breast feathers are black on a gobbler. They're brown on a hen. It's more of this color. Yeah. I'm talking about the, the breast feathers. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but you just, make sure it's a male otherwise you know it's got very rare for a hen to have a spur very very rare yeah but yeah. most males are going to have spurs so if you have a bird come up there and it's full strut and gobbling gobbling does that mm-hmm. necessarily mean it's a hundred percent of uh, a male Hens bird? can gobble they don't so say often it. but they can they can <laughs> certain they certainly strut and, yeah and posture a lot so you've got to be careful that's why i brought that up because i've seen this and uh yeah. so just because a bird comes in you're like oh i'm sure it's a male it it was strutting out there and uh, even heard right. it make an attempt to gobble i just thought it was a jake <clears throat> still could be a hen right could could yeah males yeah. are much bigger they're glossier blacker red white blue head beard spurs when they go to that's, in full that's strut it. that turkey that beard is usually pretty visible you right. pretty much know what you're if you're looking at the right spot you, it's it's there it's right. pretty easy to find mm-hmm. next question is from cliff wants to know how does a youth document their age when they harvest a turkey so i'm guessing they go online and they go mm-hmm. through the telecheck how do they document their age on there as not needing to have a license well, you're going to need to use Social Security number anyway. Okay. Um, I don't think you need to put their exact age. I, I understand what you're saying, but there's an option there when you're telechecking for youth. Yeah. Um, 
I know there is when you do it over phone and definitely is on the website too. So you brought up a good point. Mm -hmm. You're gonna take a youth hunter. Uh, m most people, you know your, you know your son or daughter who might be youth hunting their social security number? I've got it on a spreadsheet on my phone. I so don't have it memorized, unfortunately. It's one of those yeah. things that if you're gonna go out and hunt, that's one of the things that's often forgotten is the, wait a minute, I'm taking this other person. Do you know, even if they have their license and they're over 12 and they need their license, they also need to have their, you need another social security number, right? So right. make sure that's something that you pick up and take with you in the, in the field or at least have a picture or memorize it, whatever you wanna do. My advice, unsolicited here, would be to take a pen or pencil. Yeah. It's just as important so you can yeah. fill out your harvest log. Yeah, your harvest Absolutely log. Absolutely the and most your... important thing to yeah. do. Next question is from mm -hmm. David Beard. Is it possible that bag limits will change in the future? <laughs> It's possible. Yeah. Uh, we don't have plans at the moment, but that's, again, back to the banding research. The reason we're doing this research, it's turkeys are cool, and I love to learn things about animals just because, but we're not doing this research just because. Yeah. We're doing it to understand the pressure we put on the population, and depending on the findings, it might suggest a regulation change would be in order, and one of the options would be a bag limit change. Mm -hmm. So it's a possibility. Just not something we're entertaining this season or, or probably next season. So many factors go into bag limits and people think that all the time that a bag limit is, uh, is the easy, quick fix to turkey populations. But it really, you know, we've seen it in deer that sometimes we can uh, offer unlimited does, but the simple fact is, is that people go out and once they take their, their buck, they're kind of done. Mm -hmm. You know, like, you can offer unlimited does, but one buck, and we end up with close to a 50-50 split, right? If you offered people three, four birds, some people wanted one bird and they're done anyway, right? Some people might take more. It, it's never a really good, it's hard to figure out what you're gonna get in that situation. Like right now, our, our overall number of people that are purchasing a turkey tag and hunting turkeys, is it increasing or decreasing? Overall, we haven't seen a whole lot of change. Pretty much Just stable. in general, in, in the eligible sportsman so that I can't tease out hunters <laughs> like if you buy a sportsman's license or a, yeah. you know a, a, a senior. Yeah. I, I can't tell if you turkey hunted or not, but you're eligible. The sales in those those uh, licenses have been fairly stable. And so what percentage of the people that have a turkey license harvest a bird? Mm, success harvest at least one bird is probably between thirty and forty percent. That's okay. what our surveys are suggesting. Now, of the successful people, of the telechecked birds, 25% of those people kill two. Two birds. So if they're, if yeah. they're hunting and they're avid turkey hunters, it's a pretty mm -hmm. long season. They're, they're, most of them are successful in taking two. Yeah, yeah. So, but if you got a piece of property and you feel like, oh my gosh, we don't have enough turkeys, and you hear a bird, you get out there and you hunt it, and you harvest a bird, but you think mm -hmm. your numbers are down, hunt a WMA, Go out there and, and enjoy the birds without taking a shot. You can always, if you own the property, you can make the rules and restrictions more more tight, right? Right. So yeah. uh, I, I did that this past year. I went out and took a bird on a piece of property that I'm used to seeing quite a few birds. Had another piece of property that I could hunt. Didn't hunt that farm anymore after I took that one bird. I was like, you know what? There might be 30 more birds over there. There may not be many mature male birds. We, 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 did, we elected to hunt a different piece of property. Right. It was actually two years ago. So hey, you can always be, you can always be, you don't have a lot of science on your side, but if you know what your eyes are seeing and you know that, hey, I know I'm, only, I'm allowed to kill two birds, but I've got me and my brother and his sons, they're all gonna go kill two birds a piece and you don't think the land can sustain it, then hunt somewhere else or go out there without taking a bird. It's obviously an option, right? Yep, it's in your hands, yeah. Um, Next question is, can I set up a hunting blind in the same day of a turkey hunt, or are they too skittish? This is a good question. Have you ever went out and set up a turkey blind and hunted it that, that day, the day you put it up? Yes. Have you had luck doing that? Yes. I have too. Yeah. I sure have. Yeah. yeah. Now, would I prefer to get it set out there and brush it in a couple of days early? Sure. I would, but yeah. there are times where the, you know, you can put the greatest game plan together and know exactly right where you're going, right where they're going to be, and then they're not there. And you want to make a move. If you, if you think you need that blind, or if you got a youth or something, and you think you need to make a move, you can certainly put a blind up and kill a bird day of putting that blind up. Sure. 
So, uh, yeah, I would say absolutely you can do that. George uh, Phipps wants to know, uh, why does Tennessee and Virginia open turkey seasons before Kentucky every single year? Well, Tennessee actually no longer opens earlier. As of last year, they've moved their season to coincide with ours, basically. Okay. They open exactly when we do, and they've lowered it to a two-bird limit. They used to be four-bird limit. We've always been two. They used to open two weeks earlier. Now they open right when we do. Yeah. So it's in response to these population declines people are talking about. So they've moved their season back to where we are. Virginia is a little bit earlier. It's not that much that much different. Um, again, the exact date that you open a season is probably pretty arbitrary. You know, some states open it on exactly a specific date every year, so the day of the week will vary, and some will pick a weekend. So, a, a reg like ours so that it will always open on a weekend. It's, it's more important that you're generally in mid-April, you know, because we're trying to time our hunting in relation to, to the nesting season uh, to make sure that breeding occurs before we start harvesting these gobblers. So any given state is going to have a potentially a little different regulations, but Tennessee and Kentucky and Virginia are all, all kind of on the same latitude, so generally our seasons Although they're a little bit earlier, they're not that much different. Well, and as you go further south, like Florida, Florida, it's open. It's yeah. open. So mm -hmm. if you go further south, those birds are seasons they, open. They've so. already started their breeding season, and so it's uh, <laughs> it's it's open, right? So yeah, yeah. The sun. But yeah. Tennessee being south of us, it makes sense that they've been they but now they're moving, and as I'm sure this is a response to lower turkey populations, right? Yeah, it's just a concern to to try to do what they can to see if, you know, if we can allow more breeding to happen, if that's going to make a difference. I don't know, but you know, their seasons could change in the coming years. You know, this is all adaptive management that all the states are undertaking. So. Donnie Dunaway wants to know, is it legal to harvest a white male turkey? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. And people think, oh, a white turkey, this is a tame turkey. You know, there, there is a such thing as a either gray or white colored Wild turkey. Yes, yeah. I, I would just advise, you know, make sure it's a wild one. Don't go shoot someone's <laughs> farm turkey. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's legal. And uh, I'll tell you what, I've seen quite a few of these. This is the time of year, a lot of times when uh, it seems like for whatever reason, when we go down to fish uh, the white bass run, I've seen them several times in Hart County, mm -hmm. driving those fields, look over, and you know, you always take a double take and slow down, like, did you see that? And what they, it's actually called... Uh, Lucistic. It was actually white, yeah. Yeah, it's, what's it called again? Leukistic. Leukistic. Yeah. A lot of people call it smoke phase, which is different, right? A little grayer, yeah. A little grayer type bird. But, uh, yeah, they're out there, and uh, if they're a wild bird, they're certainly legal, right? Yes, sir. Next question. Uh, let's see here. Get our next question here. Uh, Caleb, what is the most common turkey hunting violation? This is a good question. It is. Um, I'd say a lot of times I see where people forget to plug their shotguns. Yeah. Um, obviously, a shotgun can't hold any more than three, so mm -hmm. I includes one chambered, two in the magazine. Um, people a lot of times will go out and buy these new shotguns and forget to put the plug in it. And they'll go out there and have five in their shotgun. That that's illegal. That's a problem. We can't have that. So. Yeah. That's, that's probably my best answer for them. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the unplugged shotgun. You know, that, that goes for a lot of different game species, but obviously turkey hunting for, with a shotgun, make sure that it'll only hold three. Yes, sir. Not that you could have three in it, it'll only hold three. So you got to make sure that you try to put that fourth in there and it won't take it, right? Correct. Yep. Um, ammunition. We're getting, you know, all of these variants now of these heavy loads, be it tungsten and mm -hmm. all the things that people are using now to shoot turkeys. Some of these shots have some wide range of different ammos, five, six, and sevens, and all these different combinations. What is the rule and regulation for shot size that you have to watch out for when you go out and you buy a box of shells and take them out and pattern them with your shotgun, and you realize, wait a minute, this yeah. may or may not be what I'm looking for? Because some of them are lead combinations with tungsten in there. Yeah, uh, they can be lead or uh, steel. Mm -hmm. um, there's no restriction on that. It cannot be any greater than a, a size four. Size four. Yes, sir. And that's some of these combination loads that I think are made for duck hunting will have 
three, okay. but then it'll have tungsten load in it too. So you got to be careful when you go look at those because you're like, oh man, this is great. I get the combination of both lead and tungsten. And but you got to be careful if it's got something smaller or larger than four, which would be a smaller number. Right. Then you got to then that's not for turkeys, right? Yes, sir. All right. I ran into that, so I uh, thought I thought I would throw that out there. Next question is from um, uh, Gene Nor uh, Newman wants to know when should I use a hen or a gobbler decoy? Man, depends on the day, depends <laughs> on the bird. It's yeah. really hard to predict. Yeah. Sometimes gobbler decoys, Jake decoys will work like magic, really sim stimulate that aggressive behavior, and sometimes it will make them go the other way. Yeah. <laughs> it's just really hard to tell. Yeah. So be prepared, different tactics. Yeah. yeah. It's just, if somebody figures that out, then let me know. <laughs> if you do figure it out, come here. We'd like to have you on a panel because uh, I have yeah. seen the same thing. It's I've fun seen... when they react to decoys. It is yeah. really awesome, but sometimes it can be detrimental, so. Yeah, yeah. I have, I have pulled decoys and put them back in the truck for the remainder of the hunt, and sometimes I won't hunt that farm with decoys anymore because for however a bird responds to it, it's just not positive. It's, it's, they're gone. Yep. And that, uh, that's never fun to work a bird. You, you always want to feel more encouraged when you know they've laid eyes on your decoy, not less encouraged. When yeah. you feel like that, you're like, okay, well, this, is, uh, this has got to, something's got to change here. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocky, is there something genetic that causes multiple beards and bearded hens? Well, some, some turkeys have two and three distinct beards that come from their, their, their breast there. Yep. What causes that? It's just genes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, really. Uh, it's in the cards or it's not for them. And, yeah. You know, hens is a small percentage of hens, but uh, there's, we don't know, there's nothing we can do to, to know that. You know? So that, it'd be like saying, hey, we've got uh, drop time bucks on our property. Well, then you have it genetically and you may keep having drop time bucks. And I guess if you have bearded, double and triple bearded turkeys, as long as they continue passing those genetics, you got a chance to keep producing those, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. it's still going to be a small, relatively small percentage of the population. Yeah, yeah. But, but it could happen. It's really yeah. neat when it happens. Brad, um, let's say you have a tom gobbling uh, on his own really well. You move close and then you try to call to him or her and you never hear that bird again. What's your best opin uh, opinion on why they went silent? So you hear a bird. You make your move, you start calling, you never hear him again. Where do, how do you think you messed up? Or do you think that bird's still there? All the above. Yeah. It's just hard to know. Sometimes yeah. you're not as concealed as you are and they're gonna see you. Sometimes they've just been called to so much, they, they get nervous and you know, you'd be better off uh, not trying to get so close to them. Because when they, if they respond to you, they know where you are. Mm -hmm. At that point, you need to really think about, be real strategic about when you call mm -hmm. and where you call from because he's just honed in on you. Mm -hmm. if, he can, if he has responded, he knows right where you are. And it may take him two hours, four hours. Good chance he's coming. It's a good point. So if, if you're in the morning and it's, it's dark and you hear one gobble on the limb and it's still dark, how close do you like to get to a bird still in the tree before you set up? I'm always afraid I'll bump them, so I don't know. I mean, it, 100 yards maybe rule of thumb, but it okay. just depends on the landscape too, if it's hilly or flat or, you know, if there's traffic around, you know, and there used to be vehicles, I mean. Now, what about a bird already on the ground gobbling? Like it's midday and you hear one gobbling, how close do you like to get before you set up? Uh, I mean, it, it depends on that cover. If it's early season and leaves aren't really out yet, then you got to be real careful. Yeah. Uh, try to use terrain to your advantage whenever you can. Mm -hmm. But it's I, maybe I don't a know. couple hundred yards at that point in time. Once on the yeah. ground. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. if he can hear you, then it's just whether or not you can pull him away from whatever hens he's got. Eventually, you, you might be able to. Yeah. So, yeah. what's the, what's the furthest you've ever seen a bird call to uh, come to a call and finish out all the way to the where you want uh, me personally it's 200 or so yeah, yeah. place in Fayette County I hunted one time yeah but that's, some that's, people talk about them coming up farther so yeah. you know it, it can happen but they, they, they're not necessarily gonna gobble the whole way they may be I, I, I like to know the number of people that have called and worked a bird 
until they thought that bird had gone and the bird wasn't responding anymore and they picked up to move and they see the bird take off. Yep. Man, they will, they will at some point in time, a lot of times they'll go quiet on you and they're not gonna necessarily gobble on a string right to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, when in doubt, you think that bird could be potentially around, give it a little time because uh, I've seen that happen myself several times. Yeah. Yeah. Unfo unfortunately, it's frustrating when you, th you think you got a bird committed and then they go quiet and you give it another 30, 40 minutes and you think, well, okay, that bird's not coming and then you see the bird. Yep. It can happen. Um, next question. How long do we have to hang on to our hunter's harvest log? Into the season or until the license expires? I guess, uh, so in the field, how long do they need to have that hunter's harvest log on them? It's good to hold, go ahead and hold on to it until the license expires. Yeah. Um, definitely into the season, you know, yeah, it, it's good to just go ahead and have it on record. Um, the good news is you can go on there and print them anytime you want. You and, can, uh, you can. I like to do that because I don't write real fine, real legible on my license. So after I fill it in, it looks like uh, I got my numbers written on the side and it turns and it goes down the edge of my license and it gets wet and everything else. You just go on there on reprint it and it'll digitally print out your confirmation number and everything on there for you, yeah. which is really, really handy. Yeah. So I turn, it seems like I end up printing mine two or three times a year based on wet, lost, whatever. So you can uh, go print that anytime, mm -hmm. can't you? Yep. Uh, next question from Andrew. How long does mating season for turkeys usually last? Well, uh, if you've been outside in the last month, then you've seen breeding behaviors, mm -hmm. but probably not breeding yet. Mm -hmm. um, although it's possible, most hens are not, not receptive yet. Mm -hmm. Actual breeding is probably gonna happen in April, mm -hmm. uh, April and May, but you know, places that don't hunt turkeys, unhunted populations, I mean, they're potentially breeding, certainly gobbling well into June. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So uh, the actual main part of the breeding though is gonna happen in, in April. It's kind of like the rut's the same deal. I mean, the rut yeah. is a long period of time. There's a peak mm -hmm. rut, but then yeah. there's a secondary rut. And right. so it's, it's kind of the same for turkeys. Cause you talk about re-nesting. So a turkey that loses a nest can Re, re nest again. Now that requires a, a, a secondary breeding, or can they re nest without a secondary breeding? They can do it without yeah, the yeah. breeding. Yep. Okay. They've got st sperm stored. Okay. They can do it. Very cool. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Ty. He said he's getting uh, his degree in wildlife conservation and would like to find a career in the field. Any advice from the panel on how to get into this field? Uh, I'll say. Uh, you know, if you have uh, a niche that you like, uh, you know, if it's turkeys, uh, we have uh, turkey biologists, uh, the Zach or small game people or private lands management stuff, uh, call them up, talk to them, see how you can get involved. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually over the past three, four years, the agency's hired more people uh, than in the past uh, 15 years I've worked with the agency as far as uh, biologists go. So, uh, you know, if you're, on the career path for that, I'd say reach out to uh, the agency, uh, talk and get talk to the biologist that you may be interested in, uh, and get involved. Yeah. Uh, the the more you're involved, the, the better uh, better off you are as far as preparing yourself. So. Getting some real live field experience, even though it might be a temporary position, man, that uh, it's really good when you when you can get some real hands-on experience with the technician out in the field. And we yeah. have we we have interns for certain bi biology fields, right, that they can get involved? Yeah, at least volunteer opportunities. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as interns, uh, not so much, but okay. there, there's a lot of opportunities uh, from prescribed fire to pulling CWD samples to, uh, uh, you know, uh, doing certain kind of bird counts, that kind yeah. of stuff. Okay. So there's all kinds of opportunities to get involved yep. and, and, and learn. Yeah, just get involved in some form or fashion and reach out to the department and ask that question. I'm sure that, you know, you, you don't have to just catch these, these panel of people. There's a lot of people who work for the Department of Fish and Wildlife. You can always reach out on our, our call info line and, uh, and ask to talk to a biologist and uh, leave them a voicemail if they're out in the field. And I'm sure they'll get back with you and they'll help you out. Next question is from Terry Cox. 
uh, what is the range a tom turkey will travel during the season? Now, you've been doing some studies on this as well, right? Uh, with some of this banding, you know exactly the location where they're abandoned, and you know mm -hmm. the location that the bird was harvested. That's not the maximum range, but we know what the range can potentially be. Mm -hmm. what, what is a Tom's range? We've had some banded birds uh, harvested up to eight miles away. Okay. That's rare though. Most of them are within a mile. Yeah. So typically the same general area that they were banded in, but uh, a few years ago we had a bird uh, move, I think it was uh, about seven miles down the river uh, from where it was banded on opening day. We banded it as a jake and it's a two-year-old bird and it makes a movement a couple weeks before season. On opening day it's shot seven miles down the river, so wow. pretty neat, but it's not that common. Usually they're in a little smaller, smaller area. So we, we had a couple questions earlier about uh, about youth season, and we had uh, questions about blinds, hunting from a blind. When you take your your uh, youth out this year, you gonna be hunting from a blind? Probably some of both. Uh, I don't like being confined to a blind. It, they're great tools, but mm -hmm. uh, usually I'm too indecisive in the moment, and it's like what I'm what I'm hearing, what I'm feeling, and I like to be able to move. Yeah. Plus, I like to try to keep. I like being the added challenge of being exposed and having to be still and woodsmanship something that I think we should try to pass on to, mm -hmm. to youth, the new hunters, you know, because there's, you've got to be still, whether that's turkey hunting or deer hunting. So mm -hmm. it, it takes practice to get still, yeah. especially when the pressure's on and there's a bird right there. <laughs> what about you? You think you're going to plan on using a blind? Yeah, you know, I think I always start off using a blind, but uh, then I always yeah. get out of it. And, I think Go it's always a good something. idea to have yeah, a blind yeah, out there. Yeah, no, it is, especially for youth. I mean, they give them the idea of, you know, uh, of the, the excitement that they're going to feel when that turkey comes in and, yeah. you know, to be able to move and get around. And uh, it's an added challenge to take somebody else and, and get them on a bird. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's And I'll tell you awesome. what, a blind is really good. You, you get all of a sudden that little pop-up shower and you get a downpour. If you got a place to jump in there real quick and so, stay somewhat dry, it makes for a little more... Uh, a little more pleasant experience than being mm -hmm. soaking wet. So I like to have a blind out there. I don't like being confined to a blind either, but for me it all really depends on how good is this youth hunter? Can they be still? Because it, yeah. it's you almost have to bust a bird to experience how still you really have to be. Because you think that when you're deer hunting you have mm. to be still. Turkey hunting's a different ball game, isn't it? For it as, is. As yeah. far as being still. You're on the ground level with them, and early in the season not a whole lot of cover. They, um, they're pretty slick. They got great eyesight, don't they? Sure. Yeah. Just be nice to be prepared. Depends on what your property you're hunting yeah. like, how much flexibility you have, different spots you have. You may be relegated to a blind, you know? Yeah, yeah exactly. All right, here we go. Uh, Nathan wants to know, can you explain how reaping works? Now, reaping um, is a technique of luring, luring a bird. Tell me a little bit about this technique, reaping. Yep, so it's, you're using a fan and put it in front of your body and you're, you're trying to essentially convince that bird that there's another bird, you're it. And sometimes that can really elicit aggressive behavior and they can come right to you on a string. Yeah. And it can be very effective. It can also not be sometimes. It can also be very dangerous. Yeah. Um, it's not something your traditional turkey hunters, guys that would have started hunting 25, 30 plus years ago, that wasn't even a technique, and a lot of a lot of your purest traditional guys kind of don't even consider it. Uh, mm -hmm. They would prefer to call to the animal and bring it in. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it's it's a little truer to the biology because they are aggressive. Males are aggressive, but again, you've got to be very careful. Be, uh, if you want to do this on WMA, man, I, I, I just one I absolutely don't recommend it. You need to know where every hunter is out there, and you need yeah. to make sure that you're in a situation where you're. Plus the bird can come in to you so close that you may not be able to get a safe ethical shot at it. It may be too close and you can easily miss or wound a thing. And so you've got to be, you got to, got to be prepared for it. It can work real well and it can, mm -hmm. sometimes it doesn't. It seems to me like, uh, you know, everybody's got 
very high quality cameras on them right now. And reaping seems like it's a technique that everybody's like, I want to try to get a bird real close on camera. And it's becoming kind of popular because it's a, it is an up close personal experience that you can get a bird mm -hmm. right on top of you. But you might scare them away to the other hillside too, because they have to, you have to convince a, an animal that's got excellent sight with this tail, fa this tail fan mm -hmm. that you're a turkey. <laughs> right. <laughs> Which is, uh, it, it can go good or bad, so it can, okay. you got to be cautious with that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you're going to WMA, I do not recommend trying that out because if you're good enough to fool another turkey, you might be good enough to fool another hunter, and that would be the absolute ultimate worst case scenario, right? It would, yep. Well, guys, I've learned a lot about turkeys uh, today, and I appreciate you guys coming in. Um, if you have a piece of property that, uh, that you're out there that you, you want to have a biologist look at to help with any of your wildlife needs, please reach out to Jacob and yeah, his please. crew, and they'd be glad to come out there. And it starts off with a form, right? They're going to fill out a form, and you're yeah. going to kind of figure out what they're trying to do with their property, what tools yeah. they have, and uh, put a plan together. It's not a it's, it, if you're trying to do it for this year, you're probably late. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sure. uh, for the for yeah. for the future, that's a great way to go about yeah. it. And uh, if you kill a if you kill a banded bird, we want to know about it. Yep. If you uh, if you see a sick bird, which we've not been getting many reports of sick birds, right? Adult birds. We get a handful every year. A handful, so it's not like something we know. expect a lot. But if you get that's it, right. we definitely want to know about for it, sure. right? For sure. So mm -hmm. all right, and keep those plugs in the shotguns, right? That's right. Yes, sir. <laughs> Hey, it's been fun. Hopefully, hopefully you've enjoyed uh, this turkey question and answer show. Uh, and you know, turkey season's right around the corner. Make sure you get out and get your license. It's always a good idea to pattern that shotgun. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I'll see you next week. <laughs>